Well, have you ever thought about running away and creating a brand new life? Or maybe you've wondered, you know, how does somebody actually fake their own death? Maybe how fugitives remain on the run for months and sometimes years before ever being caught. How easy is it to vanish into thin air in this digital age that we live in? Well, our next guest did just that. His name is Evan Ratliff. He's a freelance writer for the magazine Wired, and he's here to tell us about his time on the run. Evan, welcome to the show. Great to have you. Thanks for having me. Thanks so much for being here. you you got to set this up for us because you vanished. Your whole story gained national attention, but tell us the reason why you decided to do this experiment. Well, I started out because I was interested in people who faked their own death, and I was actually writing an article about a collection of people who had faked their death for a variety of reasons. And as I was writing it, I could never quite get to the sort of emotional side and the sort of really fine-grained details of why they did it and what it felt like, and then how they managed to stay on the run for as long as they did. So I decided to try to do it myself. Well, why not? Why yeah. not? Just do it on your own. <laughs> so you go vanishing. And tell us the story behind like all the pre-planning and how much pre-planning goes into vanishing. Well, for me, I spent about two and a half or three months trying to work out exactly what I would do. I set up a new identity, a new name. I tried to create uh, an online presence around that name on Facebook and websites. And then I also tried to figure out how I would secure information about myself, how I would use anonymous email when I was on the run, how I would use prepaid cell phones on the run so that I would basically sever ties from my previous life and not use anything associated with my real name. So you put the dare out to the public to come find you. What were the parameters you put, put out there as well? We basically said that people could, anyone could join the contest. There was a $5,000 bounty on my head, $3,000 of which I would pay out of my own pocket to make it more realistic for Oof. me. And then they could look up information about me online. That, that information would be parceled out, my phone records, my credit card, uh, my bank accounts. And then they could use that to try to figure out where I would go and what I was doing. And then if they found me in person and took my photo and said a code word, they could win $5,000. You said you'd, you gave 3000 of your own money to make it more real. What do you mean by that? Well, if I was just sort of running around the country and people were following me, but I didn't really have a strong incentive to stay hidden, then it would feel that much more like a game. So, of course, it wasn't absolutely realistic in any way, but we <laughs> wanted to seem, I wanted to feel the paranoia of someone who ah. had something to lose if they were caught. So tell us how you set it up, though. You told your girlfriend, your family, I'm gone, I'm out of here for 30 days, right? Mm -hmm, how months. difficult was it to kind of say goodbye to everybody for like those 30 days? It was tough. I mean, it was, it was actually different than just saying, I'm going on a trip for a month by myself. It was because it sort of had this element of, I don't know what's going to happen, and they didn't know where I was going, and they didn't know how people would respond or right. if people would be, you know, hassling them or harassing them or, or harassing me. Take us through your first day, because we know on your first day you go to Vegas. You sell your car. In real life, you sell your car. Mm -hmm. Set that up for us. So I, I was living in San Francisco at the time. So I drove, I actually drove out of San Francisco and I kind of did a little feint where I, I set off the toll device in my car to make it look like I was going one direction. Then I stashed ah. that. I drove south all the way overnight to Vegas. And then I sold my car in the hopes that they would think that I was still in my car somewhere in the U.S. And instead, after that, I was taking buses and trains. And I stayed in Vegas for a few days, and I actually rented an office and set up some computers there that I could use also to throw people off my trail. I mean, people were serious. I mean, there were Facebook accounts made, the search for Evan Ratliff. People were on Twitter. I mean, blogs were out there. How difficult was that for you, having that much information out there and then still trying to remain missing? It was difficult. I mean, it was, it was very creepy when people first started posting things about me and and you know all these people that I didn't know 500 600 posts a day of people and then sort of thousands more following it and, and people knew about your family your family's age like your I mean that's weird they looked up yeah my information about my family they looked up every address I'd ever lived at they found things like my mechanic that I used and my cat sitter that I used and they contacted those people and tried to see if they could glean any information. I mean, there were people making calls to everyone I knew and emailing everyone I knew trying to figure out where Talk I was. with us about these disguises that you use. I know we have some pictures that we want to show people. I mean, you went through some pretty crazy transformations. So tell us what we're looking at so now. Those, those were pictures of me that appeared in Wired Magazine in August. So those are the pictures that people had to go on initially, and there were many more online that they found and that were handed out. Oh. And so I... First, I grew my hair out a little bit. I grew a beard. 
That was kind of my initial disguise. And I shaved into a goatee and dyed it, and I kind of did this slick back. Uh, and those are fake glasses that I'm wearing there. They look great on you, though. Um, and then I went, that's when I, I moved to New Orleans for a bit of it, and that I went for more of a local look with the hat. And then my best disguise was shaving the top of my head and shaving my goatee into a mustache. And then I went with a little more of a businessman, uh, middle manager kind of look. And at the very end, I shaved my head entirely. The response that you received for a lot of people that were looking for you, it seemed like it was mixed. Why, I mean, what were some of the mixed responses you received from the public? Well, there were, there were all kinds of people looking for me. Uh, people were looking for me because they want to win the money, and some people just were really interested in the contest, and they thought it was a fun challenge. And then there were other people who had, they were intrigued by the idea of escaping their own lives, and they were kind of wrapped up in that. And then there were people who, there was one woman whose father had disappeared oh, when wow. she was a child, and she just was kind of interested in, she never knew what that was like for him, and she wanted to kind of get involved and just maybe glean some information. So what did this. you learn from this whole experiment, you yourself? I mean, can people vanish into thin air? People can certainly vanish in, in, the, in the modern era, unlike maybe 50 or certainly 100 years ago. It's a lot more difficult to just move to another side of the country and start over under a new name. There's so many restrictions on you need an ID for everything, and there's so much technology that if you use it, your, your identity gets kind of caught up in it, and people can use that to find you. You were found, we should mention, on day 25 mm -hmm. by Leaf and Fillinger. Is that right, Mr. Leaf and F Mr. Fillinger? Yeah, th those are two guys who work for a, a pizza place in New Orleans, and they, they're the guys that actually found me in person. And that's what you looked like that's when they found like you? That's what they looked like when they found me. And they were, they were actually working with a guy in Seattle who did all of the, his name is Jeff Reefman, and he did all the technical work to trace me online to find out where I was all over the country. So what is it like now being <laughs> Evan Ratcliffe? This is you, you really are in existence, you're no longer missing. Was it difficult to kind of come back to your normal life? It was, uh, well, it was a huge relief not to operate under a fake name and, and a fake identity. That's really difficult to do and you're, you're sort of deceiving people on a daily basis and that's not a pleasant thing to do. Lonely? Yeah, it's lonely, it's isolating and I wasn't talking to my family, I wasn't talking to my friends, so it, that, that part of it I, I didn't miss. There was something nice about being away from everything and kind of not having to deal with any of my work responsibilities or wow. anything else at home. So there was a nice aspect to it. Well, there we go. Listen, you can read more about Evan Ratcliffe by coming to our website, everybody, WTNH.com. Click on Connecticut Style. We'll have the link. Evan Ratcliffe, thank you so very much for oh, being thanks here. Thanks for having me. We appreciate it. I like you with a full head of hair, by the way. Uh, I think it's better. <laughs> All right, everybody. Ivy Levy teaches us how to make her classic chicken soup with Connecticut Style returns. Stick around, everybody.